Hi folks, here's part two of our chem intro. And in this video, we're gonna focus on structure of the atom. So if you remember from the last video, we have three different subatomic particles and um, just those three subatomic particles are organized into atoms all of the different kinds of atoms. So there are two basic areas in the atom. Most of the mass of the atom is concentrated in an area called the nucleus. Nucleus is a term that's used a lot in the sciences to refer to a concentration of material. So we'll talk about nuclei of cells, nuclei in the brain, nuclei in atoms. Um, nucleus is the singular nuclei oops, is the plural. So if that's where most of the mass of the atom is, and if you think back to the first part of the lecture in the last video, um, that would suggest to you that we have present in the nucleus protons and neutrons, because those are the two particles um, that have mass. The other area is in the atom is referred to as the electron cloud. So why cloud? Um, because there is a, f a finite, there's a specific number of electrons associated with the atom that is depicted here. Um, in fact, there would just be two. So why does it look like a big fuzzy cloud? Well, the answer is that electrons are moving ridiculously fast. Um, so fast that although, if you remember, electrons have a negative charge, protons have a positive charge. That means they're going to be drawn together. The two electrons that are part of making this electron cloud would love to be snugged up close to the nucleus, but they're moving so fast that although they're constantly falling toward the nucleus, the momentum of their movement keeps them forever just circling. They create a cloud because they're moving so fast. And the best analogy I can give you there is, you know, if you think about a ceiling fan, which my son used to love to stare at when he was a baby, right? When the ceiling fan is stopped, you can count the number of blades. But when you turn that ceiling fan on, it's just a blur. It looks like a solid disk. And the same thing is true. With, uh, it's a useful way of thinking about electron clouds. Atoms are really small. Um, they're small, they're, um, and they're light. So if you think about water, which remember we said is two hydrogens and an oxygen, so that's three atoms all together that are present. If I have a single teaspoon of water, this is how many atoms are present in that single teaspoon of water. So you can only imagine how much there is in a glass. So, tiny. Another way of thinking about how small they are um, is to sort of try to scale up to something we might be more familiar with. So, if we think of a hydrogen atom, um, which has a single proton with a single electron orbiting around it, and I'm just drawing a circle to stand in for my electron cloud. So if that electron cloud was from a single moving electron, was the size of the cloud, the outer edge, was <clears throat> the size of the Earth, 
then the single proton that forms the nucleus of that hydrogen atom would be about two football fields across. Or a better way of saying it is if you had a two football field proton, then your electron cloud would extend to the outer reaches of our planet. So, let me back for just a second. So, what's in between that proton and the electron that's whizzing around creating that cloud? And the answer is nothing. It's a vacuum. Um, most of the atom is empty space. So what's holding the parts of the atom together, right? If most of the atom is empty space, what's holding the protons and the neutrons in the nucleus, what's holding the electrons around, especially because they're whizzing. Um, they're moving much faster than the material in the middle of the, in the, of the atom. Um, another way of asking that question is, why do atoms exist at all? And then once you have their existence, how come they have the structure that they do? And the answer to both questions is our friend electrostatic attraction and repulsion. So atoms exist, meaning, right, you've got, a, if we think about hydrogen again with a single electron, single proton, what holds the electron to the proton is electrostatic attraction between those oppositely charged particles. So in this view of an atom, we have the protons and neutrons in the nucleus, um, and they've bounded the nucleus with a black circle here, but it's not really, there's no container there. Um, and then the electron cloud is represented by the the um, three red lines, which are called orbitals. So, you said neutrons and protons are found in the nucleus when you have neutrons present, and they usually are, unless we're talking about hydrogen. So, why are they there? Well, remember electrostatic repulsion? You've got positively charged protons and they repel one another. They're pushing each other apart. Also remember that the force of attraction or repulsion depends on how far apart the particles are. So one way of thinking about why neutrons are in the nucleus of the atom, and this is just one way one simple way of thinking about it is that part of what the reason they're there is to keep the neutron or sorry to keep the neutrons are there to keep the protons just far enough apart that the whole nucleus will hang together and that's important because if the nucleus breaks down um, and you have protons or neutrons flying off, that's one form of radiation. When we talk about splitting the atom, what we're talking about is splitting the nu atomic nucleus. And that's why atomic reactions are also referred to as nuclear reactions, because they involve the nucleus of the atom. So you have neutrons in the nucleus because of electrostatic repulsion, between our positively charged protons. Now, electrons, as I said, are whizzing around the nucleus. They're negatively charged and moving super fast. Um, they are 
very attracted to the positively charged nucleus. And by the way, one thing I suppose I should say is that the fact that the neutrons are there does not change the fact that the nucleus is positively charged. You can think about it sort of like this. If I have plus one, plus one, plus one, plus zero, plus zero, plus zero, plus zero, I add it all together, I still have plus three. Okay, so the force that holds electrons to the nucleus is electrostatic attraction. The paths through space that electrons trace are called orbitals. We don't call them these patterns orbits because orbits are two-dimensional, sort of the way our planet orbits the sun. It's in two dimensions only, um, right? We're not going in 3D circle around the sun. Well, the electrons are going in a three-dimensional pattern, and so we use the term orbital. Each atom's electron orbitals are organized into groups that are called shells. And these are often referred to as energy shells. Sometimes they're called energy levels. And one really important idea, um, and it's sort of the, the, the basis for all chemical bonding, is that atoms are at their lowest energy level, which is where they want to be, and what we mean when we say that an atom is stable or not stable. They are at their most stable with a full outer energy shell. Now, the first energy shell in the atom can only hold two electrons. Um, remember, these electrons are um, repelling one another, right? So there's uh, one way of thinking about it is there's just not enough space, there's not enough volume in that first energy shell for the electrons to get any more than two electrons to settle without being um, repelled farther from the nucleus. If we have more than two electrons, let's say I have an additional, um, oops, I'll add an additional proton in here. And that way I can give myself additional electron. Um, each energy level after the first one can hold up to eight electrons. It doesn't have to have eight, although it's most stable when it does. Okay, so this idea that atoms are most stable with a full outer shell is referred to as the octet rule. And that's because prefix octo means eight, and with the exception of that first shell, all of the other shells can hold up to eight electrons. One really important piece of vocabulary to carry forward um, is the term valence electrons. Valence electrons are the outer shell electrons. So in this case, right, I only have a, I have a single shell. It's completely full, which means that this atom would be considered stable. And by stable, we mean 
non-reactive. It's not going to play with any other atoms. It's not going to participate in chemical reactions or form chemical bonds because it's already stable. Okay, so quick review. We have a centrally located and positively charged nucleus, which it is where you will find the positively charged protons and the neutral neutrons. That's where almost all of the mass of the atom is located. That very dense, small, heavy area is surrounded by an almost massless cloud of negatively charged electrons that are, each of which has a particular orbital. Those orbitals are organized into energy shells or energy levels. Okay, so the next thing I want to show you is a particular kind of model for the atom. It's called a Bohr model. Not because it's boring, but because of Niels Bohr. Bohr is the person who um, came up with this model of the atom. So in a Bohr model, you locate the protons and the neutrons in the center and the nucleus of the atom, and then you show all of the electrons occupying the appropriate level. Now, there are some couple of rules for how to do this. First is you always add electrons to your model from the inside out. And you have to fill that first shell, which remember is full with two electrons, before you can add electrons to the next shell out, so to the second shell. So in this Bohr model, which is of neon, neon has 10 protons, 10 neutrons, 10 electrons. Right, I've got my electron, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now, if you no notice how I did that, I once I filled the first shell, I used, you can think of it as the points of a compass or an analog clock, um, start with the, at 12 o'clock with the first electron, the second put at three, the third put at six, the fourth put at nine. And then if you have more than four, which we do here, we have eight in the outer shell, your next electron, you're essentially gonna start over. And the reason for doing this is that it will, as we start to draw um, Bohr models of molecules as opposed to just atoms, it will give you a sense of how to organize the different atoms. Okay, so practice with me. Right. A Bohr model of an atom that has four protons, five neutrons, four electrons. All right, so I've got four protons, five neutrons, four electrons. So I'm going to put my four protons in the center and rather than drawing a whole bunch of little circles with plus signs, I'm just going to use P with a subscript plus to stand for proton, and then coefficient 4 to indicate the number. I've got five neutrons, N for neutron, and a little degree sign there to mean neutral. So I've got my nucleus taken care of. And I usually don't put a circle around the nucleus because it's too easy when you're learning this to start to think, oh, is that an energy shell? 
or is that the nucleus? So I put two electrons in the first shell. Remember electrostatic repulsion. Try to fit any more than that in and they're going to um, be popped out into the second shell. And then I'm going to start at the top, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock. Part of the reason this is really useful is that, remember that the second shell is full with eight electrons. This makes it really easy to see if you always put your electrons along the points of the compass or 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, makes it really easy to just glance at a Bohr model and see how many additional electrons an atom needs to become stable. So the last idea I want to uh, talk to you guys about is that there are lots of different kinds of models for, excuse me, for how to display atoms. So here we've got the electron cloud model, right? Of all of the models on this page, the electron cloud model is the, the most accurate. It's two-dimensional instead of three-dimensional, but that said, um, it's the most accurate. But it's not particularly useful for the kinds of things we need to do with the model. Um, this model is useful if we had a, a color key um, so we could tell which, were, which of these were um, particles in the nucleus were protons and which were neutrons, but you can count them because they're in, easy enough to see. And then we also have the three tiny blue electrons. And um, so you can count all of the particles, but it's not going to be particularly easy to tell when you have a larger atom where the energy levels are. This model is sort of the classic atomic age model, and this shows each electron in its own orbital. But again, it doesn't give us any information about the energy levels of the different electrons. And then finally, this model, which I suppose you could call a modified Bohr model, has got the element symbol in the center. Um, and as you will learn, the element symbol, that symbol stands for the number of protons. And so you will often see the symbol instead of the number of protons. And that's what we're seeing in this particular Bohr model. So this one is useful because you can see the energy shells and you can figure out, okay, this is, if this is lithium, in fact, these are all lithium, all represent lithium. Um, you've got three protons, three electrons. The number of neutrons, it turns out, is um, doesn't matter a lot for chemistry um, or for biological chemistry. And I'll explain that more next time.